What's up guys? James Yates, the, I'm the archery content editor for Western Hunter Magazine, here with good friend Brody. He does the customer service for Western Hunter. We are here today in Brody's uh, magical back of the warehouse archery shop. We're in the back half of the Western Hunter uh, warehouse. It's actually an abandoned bowling alley and uh, pseudo archery range that uh, Brody spends his time shooting in. So it's uh, pretty good to be down here. Um, yeah, so Brody, how, how uh, you've been with Western Hunter how long? Like two years now. Cool, doing yeah. the customer service yeah, stuff. Yeah, doing customer service. Yep. A little bit of marketing too. Yep. You're doing some of those emails. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, we're here today to put together Brody's brand new Hoyt RX-7. Um, we've got some great sponsors uh, that are also participating. Um, we're going to be putting together a, a pretty big giveaway in conjunction with these films. We got products from uh, Spot Hog, Easton, uh, Hamski, Iron Will, uh, Dark Archer Customs, Threads. Um, and uh, we got some shop equipment from Last Chance Archery. This, uh, this bow press, the Ease Green Presses I've used for a long time. We've got the, their draw board, Revolution Arrow Saw. Um, so we're set to have a, a good time building up Brody's bow and kind of teaching some things along, along the way, so. Okay, man, so we're gonna start with, we're gonna get the, we're gonna put the new threads on um here in the press then we're gonna get the we're gonna get the epsilon on then uh then the site get everything get re essentially get everything mounted up then we're gonna get the d loop on get it close um then we'll then we'll start having you we'll shoot some shots get that string broke in a little bit settled and uh go from there cool let's get started one thing i want to mention is i'm putting these strings on uh, materials of construction of strings, you kind of have a few different options. I really like the X99 material from BCY. It's a blend of uh, Vectran and Dyneema. The X99 uses the highest quality Dyneema. It's uh, the SK99. Uh, Ken at uh, Dark Archer does a really good job with this material. Another thing that I really like is, is to stay with a muted color. Um, I avoid the, the more vibrant fluorescent colors, if you will. Those tend to come with a lot more wax in them uh, and dye. And what happens is that that wax and dye artificially increases the bundle size. So if you think of the string, the actual string material, the bundle, that, that wax and dye artificially increases the, the diameter of the bundle and then you serve over the top of that wax. Well, eventually that wax kind of dissipates out, if you will, um, from out from underneath the serving. And then the, the, that serving, since the bundle reduces in diameter, that serving is no longer tight around the bundle because the wax has dissipated out. And that leads to the loose serving can lead to serving separation. That, that is a big problem if you see serving separation with your bright colored strings. Um, it's because of the wax content in those bright colored strings. So Brody's ordered a nice muted brown tannish color. Um, from a serving standpoint, I really like uh, the Angel Majesty uh, serving. So these strings were built up with Angel Majesty serving, the BCY X99 uh, string material. We'll serve in the peep with BCY 3D material and uh, for loop rope or D-loop, I like uh, BCY number 24. In that, I actually like a fluorescent color because it's a little stiffer and, uh, and because it's easier to see in, in low light situations to uh, hook your release in and, and get going on your shot, so. One thing to be aware of on the new Hoyt, uh, not even be aware of, one thing that's really cool about the new Hoyt is it's a binary cam, so there's no yokes. Uh, as of the last couple of years, there are no yokes since the RX-5, including the RX-7. So it's a binary cam. What's cool about this cam is the cable will start on this side of the cam, run through the cable guard, 
roller guard and that same cable will end on the opposite side of the cam. So it's cross loading. What that does is it balances the force across the cam and prevents a ton of cam lean. Um, so when you're putting the new strings on, just be cognizant that you got a short serving section that goes on this side of the cam with that small roller and the long serving section goes on the opposite side of the cam where you've got more contact with the, with the cam itself. Checking to make sure here that as I'm unpressing the bow that everything stays in its tracks. That's obviously very important. Everything's looking good. Strings good. That cable's good. Okay, so if we pull this out and it doesn't go kaboomy, we're good. Look at that, Brody. I didn't, I didn't break your new bow. Didn't break my bow yet. Okay, strings are all laced up. Let's uh. Throw the, throw the epsilon on and cool. and get going with that. So we're gonna put the bow over here in the in the vise to mount the to mount the accessories. I like this um, this bow vise from Ram Archery Products. It's the I can't remember exact the exact model name, but it's the pro version. It's a Ram Archery product Vice Pro version that has micro adjust pretty much everything. It's extremely simple to work with and the ability to micro adjust everything. It's super easy to get everything leveled out, which I'll show a little later. So I got the, the, the Hamski Epsilon here. Uh, the cool thing about it is it's got three different slots um, depending on the, the thickness of your riser to, to help keep the, to eliminate bulk material and help keep the, uh, the rest more in line um, behind, the, behind the riser. So the reason why they manufactured it with these three different slots is uh, to eliminate bulk material so that you can then hug your quiver in closer. Anyway, pretty, pretty great idea from them. It's got these little tabs here that interface in these, in these holes to kind of keep it in a set position before you lock it down with um, with set screws. The Epsilon fits in perfectly between the tech riser on the Hoyt. Just gonna tighten this down by hand real quick. Um, we're gonna run this right on, right on the, there's a bracket here. There's a tub tail bracket that's made to go on like the Q, QAD integrated rest. Um, personally, uh, we're going with the Epsilon here based off of um, comments from Brody on what he, he wanted to see. Brody's a big time hunter. Um, personally, I like a, a limb driven rest for hunting. Brody and I have talked about this at length. Mm -hmm. Reason why I like limb driven is because the, uh, the cable here, there's really no timing issues. And if something where to the timing is essentially making the sure, sure this cord is tight down here to the bottom limb. Other, other rests, uh, like cable driven rest, will, be, will tie into your cable down here. Um, if something were to happen in the field and you were to pop that cable or the, the activation cord out of the cable, you'd be pretty screwed. Uh, the benefit of a limb driven rest is if something were to happen with this cord, um, you, you could, you could literally cut a piece of, you could take some material out of paracord and, and make an activation cord out of that. So that's pretty important. The other thing is I've just had a lot of, um, I've had zero issues over the years using these, uh, Hamski rests. They're literally tanks. Um, they're, they're built incredibly well. I've had no issues and um, like I said, they're, they're kind of foolproof in the field. I like it. It just fits flush right up to it. Yeah, that's what I, yeah, so that's the cool thing about it mounting to the... You don't have to worry about leveling it. Yeah, it yeah. Levels itself. That's what I, that's what I like to do. Um, probably didn't make that clear before. 
I'm, I'm mounting this up flush, as Brody pointed out, right to the, the dovetail bracket. Um, so there, it, it, it comes out perfectly level. And as you can see, it fits in here nicely. Between, between it fitting flush to the, do, the dovetail part of this, the, the bracket, the, the main screw that I'm tightening down now, and then this set screw, that rest isn't going anywhere. Make sure that's nice and snug. Yeah, I really liked it. They went to that system in the Trinity. They just had that little set screw. Yeah. And this screw is much more robust. Yeah, it is. Agreed. Just give that nice little snug. Okay, the, the um, attaching the activation cord uh, this piece right here, this is a rebound dampener. This is made out of a rubber type material. So typically, so the one, one potential downside of a limb driven rest is the, as you as you shoot the bow, the limb is going to continue to oscillate, um, after the shot because it, because it's activated off of the limb that that rest could then have some oscillation in it as well, or, or, you know, lift up as the as the limb comes up the launcher could come up so that's where hamski has uh um has had excellent results with this um this rebound dampener um that kind of stretches you can actually see it stretch as i'm pulling it by hand and i'm probably only putting i don't know five to ten pounds of force there and there's going to be much more force um, from the limbs after the shot. So typically what I like to do is, is I like to run this about as far forward and we'll get into this in the draw board a little bit later, but I like to run this as far forward as I can and still get good, um, and, and, and get good, um, get good activation on the rest. Basically I run it as far forward as I can and still to the point in the draw board where the where at full draw the activation cord is just 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 loose it doesn't get too loose Yeah, made pretty long for obviously just a modularity with different mm -hmm. like riser lengths, something. something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a way better system than the old Trinity Two, where it just um, used tension. Yeah, the the tension the lock. lock. Yeah. Yeah, I've 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 preferred the mm -hmm. I've preferred the lockdown the positive lockdown with the screw over the, mm -hmm. um, over that for sure. We got one of my, my favorite sites and newly released the pick mount version of it. The fat, the spot hog fast Eddie XL or fast Eddie. The XL is the one with the PM. dovetail. Yeah. Fast Eddie PM. They call this pick, the PM pick mount. Yep, pick mount. PM. Okay. So it's the fast, fast Eddie PM, uh, Hoyt, uh, with the release of the RX five, uh, came out with the Pic Picatinny mounting system. What that does is it brings the, the site more in line with the riser, the bow. It's now obviously mounted on the, the front of the riser, as opposed to the side. What this does in combination with the Epsilon rest, which is also very low profile, it allows you to suck your quiver in tighter, which we'll show in a little bit. That helps promote better side-to-side -side bow balance, uh, less torque. Um, it allows you to have less stabilizer weight, which in turn is a, is a, is a lighter bow. Um, and stability, obviously, is also very important. Without getting into, there's 
There's a few places you can install the sight on the Picatinny bracket. Before we get in the in before we get too far, I'm just going to install it in that middle position. Similar to with a with a rifle scope, uh, when you're mounting on a on the the Picatinny rail on the rifle scope, uh, you want to push that you want to push that scope forward uh, so that the the recoil the recoil of the rifle is going to recoil back. That scope's going to want to stay where it's at. So uh, it, you're, it's good practice to push the the scope forward in the Picatinny mount. Similarly on the bow with with gravity. I like to I like to push down on the bracket so that this um, is tightened in the bottom of the the Picatinny bracket. Does that make sense? Yeah, I never I have not heard that. It's good practice with the with the scope on a rifle, and it's the practice I've kind of been following here when I mount pick sights. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Snug, snug that up nice and tight. Okay, we got the initial ex accessories installed, um, the sight, the rest. At this point, before we move on to the to the quiver, do you want to get a D loop on it and shoot it for a few times? Yeah. What's up, guys? I uh, hope you're enjoying this video. You're going to learn a lot. You're learning a lot already. Um, we're doing a giveaway with this. You can win everything you've seen on here so far and that you're going to see. A uh, Hoyt RX-7, Spot Hog Sight, Easton Arrows, Iron Wheel Components, uh, even the press, like, so you can actually work on your bow. You can win that press. Uh, all you have to do, subscribe to the Western Hunter YouTube page, go to the landing page in the description of this, and you'll just enter your email address, and then follow James Yates on Instagram, Yates in the Backcountry. You should be following him already. I mean, he's got great content like this all the time. Um, all you have to do is that, and you can win this whole bow setup. Thank you. Good day. I don't know what you call these, but the, the string dampeners, if you will. Um, I'm putting those in. Um, that we pulled from the stock string and putting them into the, the Dark Archer set. Um, so if they don't come, so the peep, the, the, where the peep goes, it comes with the, uh, the comes from, from Ken with the, he's got a piece of D-loop material or uh, serving material here separating the, the bundle. So half, half are on one side, half on the other. Down here, I'm just gonna come in and more or less count, um, trying to get an equal amount on both sides. How many strings is that string? I, uh, it's probably gonna be 26 or 28. Um, the one benefit of X99, that was a great question, Brody. One benefit of X99 um, is it is it has less Vectran. Um, it's got more. I believe the the uh, content of X99 material is 80 percent. I think it's 80ish percent. Don't quote me on this, but I think it's 80 percent SK99, which is Dyneema, and 20 percent Vectran. Um, it's similar to you know the perennial powerhouse 452X. Uh, it just has less, it has less Vectran. Uh, the reason why I like the X99 material over the 452X is that the X99 or even 454, which is the new version of 452X. Um, I like the combination of the 2080 versus I think the 33% Vectran and 67% in the, in the 452X. I like it more because it um, the X99 wears a whole lot better. I shoot a tremendous amount of arrows every year, a lot blank bailing um, at the range. I've got two or three bows that I shoot, I don't know, nine to 10,000 shots a year. Last year, one of the bows that took the brunt force of my shooting probably had 6,000 shots on it. And I'm able, I'm going to use the exact same string uh, that I used last year on that same bow this year because the X99 material just wore so well. It, it, it doesn't fuzz as, as much as the 452X, but at the same standpoint, because it has the same 20% Vectran, it, uh, it weather, it, it's, it's very stable. 
Um, I've not had any stability issues. My bow's in and out of my truck when I'm at work during the day because I shoot at lunch. Um, and I've had zero stability issues with the X99. So it's a great combination of low fuzz, low, uh, it's, it's a lot more durable and it's, it's completely stable. That's a video in itself. Okay, so as I mentioned before, um, one of the benefits of the X99 material is uh, it's a, the, 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 um, each individual strand has a, a slightly smaller dyna diameter, especially with the, the X99, which uses the S, S, uh, SK99, uh, highest quality Dyneema available today. The, the strand count on this particular string is 28 compared to uh, with a 452X, um, I believe the, the running standard is about 24, a strand count of 24. So you got four more strands, which, means to meet, which leads to a more evenly distributed uh, string bundle. Um, so I'm gonna make sure that uh, when I put the, the string stop or the uh, dampeners, string dampeners back in that I've got uh, 28 divided by two, 14 strands on each side of that. 28 divided by two. Well, hey, school, listen, listen, I went to public school, all right? In Detroit, baby. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you made me lose my count. So I'm pressing, the, as I'm pressing the bow here, a couple of things that I like to look for with this last chance press, these fingers um, independently move. So before I press the bow all the way, I get it to a point where it's just, uh, it's just in there and it's holding the bow. And then I like to go around and I like to, to make sure that all of these are about the same amount of tension. These screw, these, uh, thumb dials here bring these fingers in and out. So it's really important that they, that the bows under the same amount of uh, uh, tension, the limbs. So I'm making sure these are all about the same. And then once that's done, once you've done a bow, uh, once you've done that once for the bow, you're pretty much done. Okay, so everything is looking good. Actually, when I tie the D loop, I'm actually going to back back out um, to the point where it's just holding the bow steady like that. I don't get too I don't get too um, into the arrow level or the um, making sure that I don't pull out an arrow square and make sure that it's perfectly plumb. I take a, pro, uh, a slightly different approach. So I get the bow hanging mostly vertical in the, I get the bow uh, sitting pretty horizontal and the arrow is now plumb to that, just based off of gravity. And then I'll eyeball it. You can come around here for that. So what I'm gonna do here is with the bow horizontal, I'm gonna position the arrow such that it's more or less vertical, passing through the burger hole, which is behind this RX, RX7 logo. So ab about there. Again, this doesn't need to be perfect. Okay, so what I like to do, this, this is like my uh, best, one of my best friends in the archery shop, Silver Sharpie. I use this all over the place. Uh, so it's really good to have these available. Um, Western Hunter's probably looking to get in a Silver Sharpie sponsorship. Yeah, we're trying to get Sharpie yeah, right now. Yeah. yeah, we've got some, we got a bowling ball sponsor. Yeah, we're working on a bowling ball sponsorship and a Sharpie. And actually we're gonna try to get Pilot to do pens. Pens, too. yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, we'll we get, already got the, the tree sponsor. These are from Oregon. Home, yeah, Home Depot Home supplied Depot. the, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we should be getting a lot more great content from Sharpie, Pilot, bowling ball manufacturers in the magazine, so. I like to mark the, I like to mark where, where that's sitting. Just, just uh, I'm gonna take the arrow off and tie a D loop on. Um, uh, so that's what the silver Sharpie is here. Um, just marking where that, that knock is that more or less is a, um, 
good vertical knocking position for the arrow being perpendicular to the string. So this is the D-loop material that I like. Uh, this is BCY number 24. Actually, I prefer, I do prefer a brighter color here. Um, the dye makes it a little bit more rigid than your regular like black or uh, other color. I, I really like the orange, I'm into orange. Um, so Brody's gonna get an orange D-loop. We'll have to get an exact measurement on this, but um, I, like to, I like to burn my D-loop with, with pretty big knots on the end. Um, but that, that's, I don't know this exact size, but we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out and get it in the notes. Um, that's kind of the exact size that I start with and then I, and then I burn from there. It produces what I consider a fairly normal, maybe a, tat, a touch short uh, uh, D-loop, but uh, it's worked well for me. So uh, or, uh, burning the knots in, what I like to do is take the razor blade these are your two best friends. We need to get a razor blade sponsor. Mm, yeah, who makes those? Probably. I don't know who who makes this one. Uh, Cobalt or uh, maybe it's maybe Stanley. it's Stanley. Stanley makes it. There you go. Right, I was th I was we'll thinking some, maybe we we'll could get, get tools. the Home Depot brand. What's that one called? Oh, that's not Cobalt. That's Lowe's. Um, anyway, you take the you take the the dull side of the the razor blade, and you just start pushing down into the into the cut D loop material. I wondered how you got your knots to be so big. Yeah. yeah. So the knot, yeah. Uh, Brody was just saying that I make big knots. So uh, that is true. Um, Checking out your knots. <laughs> Checking out your burned ends. So uh, yeah. So how I make the knots so big is I uh, I, I push it down like this. I kind of get it all frizzled out and. Um, Three times as much frizzing as I as I would do. So that's about about like what I like to do. And you take the bic, another best friend of the DIY archery shop, and then I kind of just rotate this through the flame. I don't like to burn the crap out of it. Um, I don't know. To me, just things that are burnt or brittle. Good. To, I pinch it there and kind of flatten it against the. Flatten it against the razor blade. Finished knot. Flip it over, do the same thing on this other side. I've never heard about doing that. About splitting it like that and then burning it and making it that big and you know everybody fuzzes it up a little bit and then just burns it on their string and it makes it like a little, yeah yeah, yeah. It's it, a little, it, you, 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 you kind of sketchy you kind of you kind of think uh oh, is that gonna hold and you know 99 out of 100 times it will um yeah i tied chris denham's uh d-loop on his last bow and uh, I, was, I was a little nervous i was a little nervous you know if he, if he pulls that thing back and it hits him in the mouth <laughs> I might not be good for my job. <laughs> yeah, you might. Uh... Anyway, so yeah, then we, uh, so let, like I said, this is a preset length, a lot of trial and error. Um, I just know how I like to cut, make my knots. There's apparently more oxygen in Phoenix than Salt Lake because that wanted to burn on me a little quicker. Elevation difference, what, what, 3,000 feet probably? Okay, so there's our, our uh, D loop. Uh, so we're coming over here. If you recall, we put these silver Sharpie marks on where, where we wanted that, that D-loop to initially be installed. So the D-loop, I like to, to tie, the hit the double half hitch, I think is what you call it. Um, I like to remember the top, the top knot or the top burned end is in towards the riser is how I do it. So this knot, when I finish the, the, the double half hitches, like that, you can see that the, this knot, this burned end is, is in towards the riser. 
I'm still kind of, this has always worked for me, so I don't do anything different. This bottom knot is going to be the opposite. So this, this burned end is going to face out towards me. So out away from the riser. Before I do that, I'm going to cinch it down with a pair of, can you hand me the Easton pliers? These things are awesome. These are the Easton, don't know exactly what they're called, but they're like their multi-use plier. I've used these things for years. Um, they allow you to separate the, the D loop with this. And then the other cool feature about the, about these pliers right here, they're intended to grab the D loop and then you're intended to roll and hook and hook that around this little nose and you can pull pretty nice feature. You don't have to get that super tight, just tight enough. And we'll do the, the knot on the other side. And those don't collapse all the way on your string, it looks like, to crush it. Yeah, correct. So as I mentioned before, um, right now at this phase, I don't, um, I don't tie any knock sets, uh, but we will uh, before we get this thing fine tuned. This is just to get relative close on the D loop and then we're gonna shoot through paper. Brody told me uh, that he likes a normal to maybe a touch short um, D loop, uh, so I kinda, catered that just based off of experience I catered the string uh, or the D loop material to what I thought he he'd like so mm -hmm. that's the finished D loop is that about yeah his? that looks perfect that looks right about what I normally shoot okay And maybe before you pull it off. So this is uh, the Sever, I think they call it Sever HD. It's a 21 inch target. Um, Brody, come pull that arrow. Compared to other targets, this target pulls, this target pulls incredibly easy. I mean, is that not oh, it's so, so, easy. so smooth? I'm just shooting it point blank. So the cool thing about it, yeah, Brody's got a 31 inch draw. It's like, uh, you know, that, that arrow is getting embedded in there deep. Um, this target, I actually helped in the, I participate in the development of the foam of this target. Uh, I personally shot a few different iterations of it. The one that Sever settled on is a very micro porous foam. It's extremely durable, but somehow it pulls incredibly easily. It's the best target I've ever used. I have four in my, my range in my shop, uh, my personal shop, I've got like four of these that are stacked up and I've got one, I've got one block that I shot all of last year, probably 5,000 plus shots in my garage and it's still the same target and it's just, it stops arrows well and it pulls incredibly easy. Really, really good targets. Okay. In all fairness, uh, uh, we kind of lied. Brody has previously put these strings on the set from Dark Archer Custom, and he uh, shot about, I don't know, what do you think he did, shot 80? Yeah, I shot close to 90 arrows. Probably 90 arrows in it. Um, so uh, the string is, is settled, um, broke in, if you will. Um, everything's rounded smoothly to the bow. Um, got that D loop on. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna put it in the last chance draw board and we're gonna and we're gonna look at cam timing, um, see where we are, uh, where the draw stops are hitting, and if they're they're hitting at the same time. We'll talk a little bit more about why that's important. So on the last chance draw board, we've got the this uh, kind of backup keeper in case the deal in case 
in case in case Brody ties your uh, your D loop on and the knots aren't big enough and they pull through, I'm, I'm just give, I'm just razzing him. Uh, this is a just just a safety catch on the last chance um, draw board. Um, so we'll, if I was I'm left handed, so my right hand sucks. Anyway, we'll get that on there. Put that in the the draw board. So this this is the this is the arrow stop. Do you have this in the eighty five percent let off mode? I believe so. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, eighty five percent. So the Hoyt the RX seven comes in uh, two um, let off positions. You got an eighty and an eighty five. It looks like Brody's got his at the eighty five. So I've kind of just got my finger right there because I don't want to pull too hard into the the cable. So I know when that that draw stop's getting close. There we are. So we're gonna look at, so you can come zoom. So we're gonna look at the, the spacing difference between the rubber on the draw stop and the cable, both top and bottom. So we're, we're just out, so I'm gonna, Okay, so right there, it's just out. And we'll look on the bottom. And the, the bottom is in, is in, um, the bottom is touching. Okay, so the bottom is just out. And the top is out what would you call that, a sixteenth of an inch? Okay, so in this case, since um, it's actually a bit of a misnomer, but um, since the bottom is essentially touching and the top is a little out, the this top cam is actually in, in, a, in a slightly advanced position. Um, so we need to speed up, uh, we need to speed up the bottom cam. Um, and to do that, we're gonna put uh, we're gonna put a twist in one of the cable ends, so we'll show you that in a bit. Okay, so from the draw board back into the press, we notice that uh, the bottom cam, the bottom cam draw stop was touching the cable before the top cam. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna make sure it's nice and pressed. The way the the way the Hoyts work, um, there's the, each cam, the top and bottom cam have a side that's more accessible. That's, that's this side on this, uh, the top, the top cam come, or the cable from the top cam comes down, crosses down here through the cable guard onto this side. This side of the cam is a whole lot easier to access than the other side. So what we're going to do since the, the top cam was not touching, we're gonna take this bottom cable end. I need to press the bow a little more. We're gonna I'm gonna take it off. And what we're gonna do here is we're going to we're gonna we're gonna twist it. When I'm doing timing, I always prefer to put twists in to the cables or to the string as opposed to taking as opposed to taking twists out. Uh, if you take too many twists out, it can kind of start to affect the bundle. Uh, putting twists in is, is definitely my preferred. So I'm looking to see how this is is twisting. I can I can kind of rotate it to see, but I'm gonna put at this point I'm gonna try one full twist. The timing was pretty good, but I'm gonna try one full twist, so like that. And then I'm gonna put it back in. We'll have Brody shoot it once or twice to settle it down, and then we'll put it back in the draw board to see how we affected the timing. Again, 
I'm constantly making sure that um, I've put the, the cable ends in and I'm even checking the ones. Uh, it's really, really, really easy to make uh, kind of dumb mistakes here. Um, and you want to catch them before something, before something happens. Sometimes you just get distracted and you know, it's good practice to just constantly be on the lookout is you're pressing a bow uh, that everything is in there appropriately. So again, putting my finger up there just just to uh, just to make sure I know exactly where I am, so I'm not over over uh, overdrawn the bow. This top cam is just, um, oh, that actually brought it in. I, I was wrong. That brought it in perfect. Your timing is like dead on. Cool. Yeah, they are both pretty much the exact same. The top, the top is a little faster, but it's less than a 64th of an inch. So. <laughs> when I say faster, uh, it's actually, it's actually just the opposite. The further away, it is from the cable. That's the more advanced position. Mm -hmm. That's actually kind of a misnomer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Because you think that it, you think a more advanced position would be. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, the advanced position actually the cam, the cam is 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 in an advanced position when it's it's more into its rotation, which is going to result from it being off the cable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so timing's good. Now what? So now there's a couple, couple of different things that we could do. Um, before we start tuning the bow, we need to get the rest of the accessories dialed. So um, we need to, we'll put the, put the quiver on, we'll get your stabilizers. We'll talk about the sta mounting stabilizers, how I like to. You're gonna need to play around um, with stabilizer weight to, to kind of get something feeling good to you, but we'll get things close and, and go from there. So we'll put, uh, cool. put some more accessories on at this point and see how she tears through paper after that. So on the string stop, I'll kind of just talk about what I, where I personally like to position the string stop. So on the, these Hoyts, there's two, two adjustments you can make. Uh, loosening this set screw will, will pull the carbon rod in and out. Uh, and then you also have a, a screw here that'll rotate the, the actual rubber dampener itself. So what I like to do is I like to be, I like to be um, about a credit card, maybe just less than a credit card's worth of gap between the string and the stop at, at, uh, at brace or, or at rest. That's about there, so I'll go ahead and set that down and see the gap that I'm talking about. About a credit card's worth. That'll be that'll be your, based off of your present, um, your preference. But typically, you want that uh, as low as low as you can get it. So what, what this this color was uh, buckskin, right? This is the white buckskin. Yeah, this is the buckskin color. And then you went with um, 
sub out looks like sub alpine accessories yep sub alpine accessories on the buck sinker i thought it looked pretty good yeah it looks good yeah did you think about doing the hoyt does the the limbs mm -hmm. the limbs as well yeah Could've, i thought about doing limbs doing with the, the sub alpine limbs uh, that would definitely look sweet yeah yeah i like the accent of sub alpine mm -hmm. so the cool thing about the stretch quiver um we'll show it here in a little bit it's my preferred quiver as well um it gets the benefit of um, balancing the weight or distributing the weight of the quiver and the arrows across the whole bow. Um, uh, just just the way just the way physics is, the way gravity is, you want the bulk of the weight of your bow to be below your grip. Um, so a two-piece quiver imparts more of the weight of the quiver below your grip your grip you can you can think of one you know like a your your quintessential one piece where it connects on the on the where you attach it on the you know the back side of your 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 dovetail bracket or whatever mm -hmm. or on the, on your sidearm um that's putting the weight all of the weight the point source the weight of all your quiver is is above your grip mm -hmm. so you can think of this as i like to relate it to holding a sledgehammer with the weight up compared to holding a sledgehammer with the weight down. With the weight down, gravity is helping you keep that steady. With the sledgehammer weight up, gravity is wanting to pull it down. So if you, if you get off access holding that sledgehammer, either way, gravity wants to make it rotate, right? Mm -hmm. So the th same thing's going on with your bow. So it's important to get the bottom of your bow more is basically heavier than the top of your bow. So mm. you've heard, you've heard, you know, different bows, maybe you've heard the term top heavy, mm, right? Sure. Top heaviness kind of will affect your accuracy. So the two piece quiver is great in imparting more of the weight for the quiver low on the bow. What's cool about the stretch quiver from Hoyt is it's a basically a removable two piece quiver. Um, so it's the best of both worlds. You can fairly quickly take this off, um, but it's also imparting a lot of the weight of the quiver low on the bow. So it's the best of both worlds. Well, Brody's doing that. Um, we've got uh, the initial position set on these stabilizers. Uh, he's gonna need to play with some weight and we'll get into how you decide how much weight you wanna shoot and where you position that weight between the, the back bar and the front bar. Generally, I like the stabilizer weight to be about as low as possible. From a hunting perspective, I don't like it to come out too far, and I also don't like it to be kind of down below the cam or out past the string. So that's kind of where we settled in on that position. What did you go with? This is the, the eight, I believe. And mm -hmm. the, is, it a, is it a four? I yeah, that's, that's, a a eight, four. that's an eight and a four. Yep, a little bit more on the back. You don't need a, it feels like you don't need as much on the front. Dude, I these bows because that weight is so much lower. Lower, yeah, mm -hmm. and it's out and it's out more forward. That's one thing that, mm -hmm. that Hoyt's done a really good job with. I don't. I'm not even currently shooting on my. I so I'm shooting an RX uh, seven, the thirty inch. This is the ultra. Currently, I'm not. I just have this. I just have the little dampener on the front here, and I have removed all of the weight essentially except for. Uh, one little one ounce weight that I've got on the front of mine. Mm -hmm. So the bow balances really well with, with little stabilizer weight. And I think that's in part because of, like you said, they moved the stabilizer bracket down. Mm -hmm. um, this is also incredibly low. Just the way the Hoyts balance with the carbon quivers um, mm -hmm. also helps. Um, this is almost like having like a, you know, eight inch stabilizer. Up oh yeah, honestly, yeah. If you're so looking at your little four inch, inch right here, mm -hmm you know, the end of the weight compared to if it were coming off right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's more than eight inches. That's, yeah. that's 10, yeah, that's like 10, 10, yeah, 10 inch bar. Yeah, 10 inch bar. 10 inch bar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that that's really cool. Then plus, you know, you're getting the benefit of having that weight as low as you physically possible mm -hmm. on the bow. Um, and, and everything's just so streamlined. So the biggest point that we were talking about these inline accessory systems here, um, with the you know the inline epsilon um the the stabilizer system and then the the picatinny bracket sight the spot hog fast eddy that we got what it's what it's going to do is it allows us to to bring this quiver in as as close as physically possible 
So Brody had just made the comment, damn, that looks tight. And it, and it really is. The, that quiver is about as close as we possibly can get it to the bow. In fact, we'll want to check this at full draw just to make sure that there is going to be no limb contact with the quiver. I don't think there will be, but that's literally how close this quiver is into the bow that I'm potentially worried about uh, the limb touching the quiver hood. So hats off to Hoyt for engineering, truly engineering accessories to go with the bow and not just, not just slapping any old accessories on it. I mean, it's truly an integrated system and it makes a difference. It's gonna lighten up the bow, better bow balance means better stability, better stability be, means better accuracy. So we'll check that quick to make sure that we've got the quiver on. We'll check that to make sure that we've got no contact when the bow is drawn. So we'll put that in the draw board just to verify that. So as we were mentioning before, I uh, just wanted to verify quick that there is no contact issues. It looks like we've got about a quarter, maybe a little more than a quarter inch clearance between the two at full draw. So quiver, quiver's looking good. It's in really, really tight. Um, I, I really like the, the stretch quiver. You can see it mounts in, uh, mounts in the two spots, helps bias the weight lower on the bow, um, ability to take it off. I think they have a I think Hoyt makes a six and a four. Six and yeah, a, they make a six, six and, and a four. four. Yeah, yeah, I think they make almost all their quivers in six and fours now. Yep. You went with the six, obviously. Oh yeah, I need six. <laughs> the way I've seen you shoot, I don't think you need six. Okay, so we got the bow back in the vise. Um, what we're gonna do now is uh, we're gonna make sure that we just really checked um, Timing at this point, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're, we're starting off on a decent um, uh, horizontal center shot. We've kind of we've kind of uh, set vertical center shot just based off of the the hanging the arrow from the string. Uh, so a lot of vice work now. Um, I really like this. Um, I've gone through three or four vices in the last ten years. Uh, my favorite one so far to date is this. Ram archery product. It's the it's the micro vice. It's got the micro adjustable in both directions. The cl the clamp works well. Uh, everything is is just very micro adjustable. Biggest thing is um, I've used you know, the 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 vices that are kind of more of the ball clamp. The problem with those is there uh, there's very little micro adjustability with those. So it's hard if the bubble is out just a little bit to, you know, if you loosen that and you bump that ball, that ball joint and tighten it back up, oftentimes you bumped it too much. Here you can literally micro adjust it to the nth degree, which we'll, we'll kind of show as we, as we get into this. So what we're going to do now is we're going to level the site and uh, we're going to also work on the um, center shot of the, of the arrow. So starting with the sight, a couple of things. Um, Brody chose to shoot the, the Fast Eddie uh, pick mount version. A um, couple of things, I, I really like Spot Hog sights. They performed very well for me. Um, one thing that I like the most about them is how durable they are. It's an extremely durable sight. Um, the, 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 just in its, its uh, construction, Brody was commenting on, on the, the machinery and the anodizing earlier. Um, they're both robustly built. They're built like tanks. Um, one of the biggest things with the site is, is how, how's the, how the site locks down. So right here we have the third axis adjustment. Um, it's locked down by two bolts. Uh, Basically, that gives you positive lockdown so that third axis can't move. Uh, the spot hog, the reason why uh, that's, that's notably different than a lot of other sites in the industry, um, spot hog's arm up through 
the slider portion of the site is one continuous piece of aluminum. Um, the reason why that's important is for durability. Spot Hog views this piece, this one continuous piece, which we can probably show better from this side. This one continuous piece of aluminum here um, is integrated into the site. So there's lots of other sites you can, you can basically swap out how the connection, connection device to the bow, not with Spot Hog, that's integrated into the site. Um, that does a couple of things. Um, so most bow sites, lots of bow sites on the market have two second axis adjustment levels. Um, a lot of people confuse the, the joint on a, tip, on, a, on a different site where you're connecting the, the bracket to the rest of the site. People will call that, mistakenly call that the first axis of adjustment. That is not. It is, it's technically a second second axis adjustment. What that allows you to do is, that allows you to independently set your, your, um, your slider dial level uh, independently of the bow level. So second axis, so you have three axes, axes of rotation. You've got your, your first axis, which is, which is this direction. Does that make sense? The, the, first, the, first, the first axis of rotation, if you're looking at it in terms of the site, no, first axis of rotation is back towards you. First axis of rotation, if you're looking at it in terms of the site head, is, is, is this direction. Second axis of rotation is this direction. And then third axis of rotation is kind of like a door hinging towards you is this direction. Most sites do n most sites these days do not actually have a first axis of rotation. Uh, Spot hogs um, before they came out with this new style bracket for attaching the sight head, they where it was just the do you remember when Spot Hog just had the bar? Yeah. The ability to rotate that bar, that was your first axis of rotation. That is the least important. The first axis actually isn't very important at all. It, as long as it's close to, you know, as long as the face of the scope housing is plumb or parallel to the string and it doesn't even need to be perfect, you're good to go. There's really no reason to need to adjust the first axis, which is why most sites manufacturers don't even have a first axis of rotation adjustment. Mm. So that just leaves your second and your third. So as I mentioned, this is your first axis. You could think of the top or bottom of your site housing pointing more towards you or more away from you for your first axis. Mm. Your second axis is the side to side. So your second axis is really important for longer shots on, on it doesn't matter, steep or flat ground. You can imagine if your second axis was off, kind of like how I'm showing my hand canted, as you slide your slider sight down, if it's on a cant, the left and right position of your pin is going to be different whether you're at the top of your slider dial or at the bottom if it's on a cant. Mm -hmm. So the second axis, the most important thing for your second axis, which is your second axis bubble in your sight, is is the bubble in your sight marks the trueness of your second axis. So the bubble in your sight needs to read level when your slider drive is perfectly vertical. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? You need to match those two. Yep. yep. It doesn't matter. It actually does not matter that the, a lot of people will level the bow, completely level, then le level the slider drive and make sure that all of those are in line with that bubble. Mm -hmm. The bow portion of it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. In fact, sites that do have that second, second axis adjustment bracket, that's the part where you can actually move that. So if, if you naturally shoot better with a little bit of cant in your bow, mm -hmm. you can have that cant in your bow and still have a, so you don't need to hold the bow level. You're gonna essentially, Put the cant in back into, into the, the yeah into the it, slider yes. drive. Now the one thing with Spot Hog is you can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, 
I actually like that. Um, I like spot hogs. I, I like the spot hog gives you exactly what you need and nothing that you don't. And they, and they have a high, they set a high precedence on durability. So spot hog has made the decision that they would rather have one continuous piece of aluminum up through the slider dial than give you the ability to independently set that second axis so that you can cant your bow. I, from, a hunt, from a pure hunting perspective, I like that because I have had so many sites fail me in the field with axes of rotation not locking down. Mm -hmm. um, so it really resonates with me what Spot Hog, Spot Hog's emphasis on durability. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we are going to, we're gonna level now the, we're gonna level the second axis to make sure that the bubble is, is, is level or the bubble is, yeah, is level when the, when the second axis is, when the slider drive is vertical. Okay, so before we, before we get uh, level in this site, one thing to be aware of on the, on the spot hog is, is you need to get your gang adjustments close. Um, what I mean by gang adjustment is you have a lot of position in order to maximize the dial length on the, on the spot hog. You want to, there's a whole bunch of mounting holes here, up and down the slider drive here. And you wanna make sure that um, you get that gang adjustment set where you want it. Brody's literally perfectly in, in the middle here. Um, Brody preemptively um, kind of got, got that figured out before we started the video. So he knows that uh, this is the position that he wants to be in. Um, to maximize the distance on his dial. Yeah, gives me plenty of room to dial down still. Yep. So, yeah, so once we've got that gang adjustment figured out, we'll now go ahead and proceed with leveling the, talk about the first axis and level the second axis. Third axis will we'll come after we get some tuning and shooting done. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna attach uh, this is another little pro tip, if you will. Hamski does uh, some of the best levels in, in the industry, in my opinion. Um, their Gen 2 third axis, their Gen 2 third, their Gen 2 third, what was that? You gotta just hold it in one spot. Oh, so sorry. You focus it on there, but you're good. The Gen 2, uh, Gen 2 Pro third axis level from Hamski is a really awesome device for, for leveling up the, the second axis and third axis on your bow. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna attach this to know when the slider drive is, is, uh, is level compare, compared to the, the bubble level in the, in, the, in the site housing. So I'm gonna attach this to the, the slider drive, the actual slider rail of the Fast Eddy. Okay, so now I can see that uh, Spot Hog did a pretty dang good job from the factory of setting the, the bubble level to the, to the slider drive. I can see that both are out about the same. So now I'm gonna use the, the micro adjustability in the Ram's archery product, Ram archery products Bose, uh, vice to level that out and see the, the micro tunability of this is just ridiculously cool that we can um, just bring that in that quick. So right now what we want to do is I want to level, I want to level the, um, the, the second axis or the, I want to uh, level the slider drive. And then we'll adjust the bubble in the scope housing to match, it's slightly out. It's pretty dang close. It's slightly out, so we'll make a... Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty close, but we'll make a, a small little adjustment. Okay, so the, there are two, two locations where we're gonna 
we're going to loosen. There are two bolts here, two uh, major bolts, a bolt here and a bolt here. What we're going to do is loosen those and then there are two uh, opposing bolts that are um, uh, set screws, if you will, that also will serve to, to lock down the second axis so that um, there's positive lockdown and there's no, no chance of it moving once those are tight. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to loosen Going to loosen the set screws just slightly. I'm going to loosen the, the main bolt here. There it is. All good? There we go. So I got that all loosened up. Now we're good, we're, now what we can do is I can physically come over here and with the with the uh, slider drive perfectly level, I can now adjust the using the micro adjust, I can use the micro adjust to these set screws to help get me perfectly aligned on the, on the bubble level inside the scope housing. A little bit of a, an iterative process, but So what I'm doing here is I'm backing one out a little bit and tightening the other as I need to in order to get that bubble level to where I want it. Just making sure again that the, the ham ski level is is perfectly level as I've bumped it a couple of times with my my hat, my body on the stabilizer down here. So one, I think one more little fine adjustment. Took it a little too far. This is one of those things that I fully believe, like setting up a bow yourself. Um, think about it from a, you know, a concept of not saying that archery shops try to cut cut corners, but if they're trying to get out a certain number of bows, they've got customers lined up. In my experience, this is something that you know, trying to get these levels exactly right. Um, I'm, I'm willing to spend the time on, you know, one of my good friend's bows, my own personal bows, to make sure that all of this is set up perfectly. Some of this attention to detail, um, I don't think you're gonna get quite at the archery shop, making sure that, I mean, honestly, 
Based off your experience, I think an archery shop probably would have thrown that up the first time and, oh, that's close enough. They would have called it good. Yeah. It, they would it, call it, good. It, was, it was a little out, a little more than, than, than I would have liked to have seen, but you come look at this now and I'm pretty sure that it's about as, about as good as you can. Yeah, you're not going to, you're really not going to get any better than that. It's absolutely perfect. Yep. Okay, so now with that locked down, we'll go back in and we'll tighten the Tighten the main mounting. Okay, so just a little bit of back and forth here on the set screws of the, once, once we loosened the, the main bolts, then a little back and forth on the set screws here to micro adjust the, uh, the bubble level in the housing, making sure it's perfectly in line with the Hamsky level, which is indicating the levelness of the slider dial. Uh, one thing that I did to tighten it all up is, so these, these are kind of, the set screws are more or less just, just barely touching the, this mounting bolt. Uh, so to, to lock things down, I first tightened this bottom one, got it pretty tight. And then, and then I came up here after and then tighten this one down. And then come back here, check to make sure everything's still, still level. Again, comparing the level, the Hamsky level to the level in the guard, everything is perfectly level. And then what I like to do, now these, these set screws or the, uh, the micro adjust screws, I like to make sure I like to snug them up. Uh, now that the, the mounting screws are locked, I'll snug these up. Uh, just to make sure that, that that'll act as like a, a, prevent, a positive lockdown so that these won't go anywhere, even if the site's bumped. So get those nice and snug. As far as I'm aware, not many other site manufacturers have this real positive lockdown you know, opposing set screws here like the, the spot hog has for the second axis as well as the third axis uh, with these opposing set screws. That positive lockdown is really important. Um, scythe can take a beating in the field and I personally have witnessed uh, third axis and second axis issues with other sites because they don't have this positive, the positive lockdown from these set screws and from these opposing uh, bolts on the third axis. So I'm going to take the, the third axis level. I'm going to put it on the string, make sure at least that the, that it's level in this direction. I'm going to use the micro adjust here on the bow vise to bring that into perfect. There it is. So the, the bow is leveled this direction. Now you could, we're not gonna do it here because we're, we're not going to set the bubble level in his, in his sight to, um, we're gonna set the bubble level in his sight to the slider drive, not the bow. But if you wanted to, you can use the third axis level to uh, align the second axis of the bow to the second axis of the sight. Again, that's not necessary, but that's how you would accomplish it with the Hamsky level. Yep. Okay, so another option, uh, if you don't have the, I think, the, I think these tools are well worth it from Hamsky, this level. Um, if you don't have one, you can use the small torpedo level. You more or less just hold it or clamp it to the, to the, the slider mechanism. And then you can just compare that level to the, to the level in the bubble and they are about as 
with me just free handing it are about as perfect as they can be with my little body um, my little body shakes and clamp that in there so I'm not so much so shaky and it's perfect so that's the two different ways uh, it's a little it's a little slicker with the third axis level that's going to be used late, a little later on to set the third axis we also showed how we can level the bow up with that the two different directions torpedo level is also useful to check in the second axis on the slider drive